Sunday morning, the start of a new week. But for Cecil Williams, time is already running out. Outside, the hungry are gathering. Inside, his congregation is waiting for sustenance of another kind. Now there is only time to take his wife's hand and make his way to what he laughingly calls the sanctuary. Each week, 2,000 people flock to San Francisco's Glide Church. It's so good, so good. With you here in the strangest place in America. Yeah. Strange it may be, but few that come here leave untouched by the energy and the warmth that they find. People come to Glide Church because they feel uh, accepted because they feel loved. They feel a sense of community. And the most serious point of my playing church was for me to imagine that one day, out of segregation and racism and prejudice and discrimination, I would have a church that was mixed. I would have a church that was diverse. I would have a church with everybody in it. I was not going to continue to have a church that wasn't that way. If this sounds like nothing more than old-style Southern evangelism, think again. So I'm warning you now, it's better to engage in justice and love than it is to uh, just come to church. This is no ordinary congregation. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Right on. Right on. Shalom, Shalom and Salaam. Salam. Williams has forged a formidable alliance that defies the barriers of race and class. The people here give their time and their money to fuel 39 separate welfare programs, all run by Glide. There's people you don't even know you're helping that you're helping. And believe me, um, Glide, along with many other places in the state of California, is not getting helped by our state or our government. Last year, those programs cost $6 million. In that time, though, the church attracted over a thousand new members, inspired by the gospel, according to Cecil Williams. The courage to be is to not see things as they are, but the courage to be is to see things as they ought to be. I love you. <laughs> You're an amazing man. <laughs> Heady praise, but the Reverend Williams makes it his job to excite and to shock people. When he came to Glide 33 years ago, he tore down the crucifix, stepped over the altar, and stood amongst the congregation. I did that to dramatize my, my, my sense of freedom. And when I stepped across the altar, I opened up my black robe and pulled it off and said, as I take off my robe, I also want you to know that the walls here are going to crumble because we're going out to where people are hurting and we're going to reach people in their desperation, in their desolation. This philosophy of unconditional acceptance seems utterly at odds with the mood of middle America. Two years ago, angered by the failure of government programs to break the poverty cycle, the nation embarked on a radical experiment in welfare reform. Hey there. All right. How you doing? Benefits were cut, time limits for welfare introduced, leaving the people at places like Glide to pick up the tab. We're seeing 25% more people in our lines, and this is not just people who are not employed. This is working poor. This is a population of working poor. What they expect is that some way, somehow, we're going to pick it up. Some of us in America, in urban America, are going to pick it up. We can only pick up so much. Now turn around and embrace your brothers and sisters. Embrace it. I don't want to. Baby girl. Baby girl. Hey, honey. How are you? You all right? You got a place to stay? For this young crack addict, a pile of blankets is home. I know you 
cold out here. She's a male prostitute, transgender prostitute. And she has to do whatever she has to do like any female would have to do. Hustle for their money. Uh, steal, lie. Everything, the whole nine yards. Bruh! Damn. You got a blanket I can buy? She's getting bones. Yeah. What's She's dying. Woman? She's dying right there. She's dying, period. But I mean, she should be in a hospital, shouldn't she? Yeah. Why isn't she? Because nobody cares. Nobody cares about what happens to her, so she, why should she? Has she got HIV? Yes. Sure. And full-blown AIDS? Yes. Really? And, and have you seen her over the last few weeks? Is she getting worse? Is She's she... getting worse. Yeah. And there's just really... And she'll be laying there when we, if I come back here today. Call me today, okay? Okay? All right, honey? Call me. And if you need something, I'll get it for you, okay? Right? I'm going. How's everybody doing this morning? Huh? Sandy Southworth knows a thing or two about survival. A former prostitute, crack addict, and drug dealer. Her home was the streets. Now she's an AIDS outreach worker at Glide. Today, she will load up her bag two or three times in her one-woman campaign to help those people America has discarded. I need a bunch of bleach, because I know they're out there today. It was Cecil Williams' brand of unconditional love that opened the door to this new life, but it did not come without a struggle. He's your mother, your father, your sister, whatever. He's all of those in one. And when, when I met him, it was like, hmm, oh, I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you, dude. But it was Williams who got her. Hey, Charlie, Tessex! Sandra! Sandra! How you doing, sir? You need some condoms? Thank you. Same sex! Oh, you want this? Yeah, that's all right. All right. You never had sex? Are you a virgin? Use it when you do. Watching this feisty queen of the streets, it's hard to imagine anything that could faze her. But here, a moment can become a lifetime. This is red. This is my friend I used to use with years and years. We used to smoke plenty of dope together. Hot huh, red. We used to smoke them up and smoke them out. And you got to use this cotton on your face. Oh, yeah. Now she's doing everything. I, uh, she turned tricks. She's, she don't like sex. She likes to give hair. She will offer her old friend vitamins, bleach for needles and cream for the sores that are overtaking her body. But Sande's affection cannot remove the feeling that these people on the bottom have simply been forgotten. Okay, promise. I love you. Okay. People need to come behind them doors and stop being hypocrites and stand up and say, hey, you are my brother, you're my sisters, we love you. My own mother will not talk to me. My own family will not have nothing to do with me because I have AIDS, because I've been, I'm dying. All I ask is a little love. All I ask is for my mother to wrap her arms around me and tell me I'm hers. So she don't do it to me. I come out here and I embrace, I embrace the community. There's not a genuine concern. There's not a genuine caring. There's not genuine compassion out there. Folks now are getting theirs. And when you get yours, you forget about those folks that you once knew or that you once responded to. Today we are taking an historic chance to make welfare what it was meant to be, a second chance, not a way of life. The president called it a new beginning. Shame. Shame. Others in his party, they preferred the term shock therapy. Legal immigrants lost assistance altogether. Anyone else out of work had just two years to find a job, or they too would be on their own. Conservatives were delighted, and in states like California, with big numbers on welfare, 
it was welcome news. We needed welfare reform simply because the welfare state, as we called it here, was out of control. At one juncture, we had about almost a million people in the state of California on welfare. Uh, it became an incentive system where it became more attractive or as attractive to stay on welfare than it was to work. For those already on the street, it was troubling. But for families already battling to survive on government handouts, it promised a firestorm. In San Francisco, this is what passes for public housing. It is not a prison, but a childhood here can become a life sentence. It was horrible, a lot of um, crime, a lot of drugs, a lot of criminal activity. Jennifer grew up in the projects, now a recovering addict, victim of incest and domestic violence. She is visiting her mother, Diane. This family's story is not unique. Its power, though, comes in knowing that it is one repeated time and again in ghettos across America. I have a sister who's older than me, and we share the same father. I have three younger brothers who each have a different father, and that's, that's my background. What she prefers not to talk about is how some of these men she called father raped and abused her. So in turn, what I did was chose a man who was also drinking and living the street life. And my three boys have, each have a different father. I went from bad to worse and to hell. If Jennifer's hell included losing her children to the state, Diane's involved watching her daughter fall apart and knowing that she, in some way at least, was responsible. A year ago, she convinced Jennifer to go to Glide. Why did you make that decision? Because inside I had died. Um, like I said, I was hospitalized. And I knew if I used drugs again that I would not be able to come back. So I decided to take it serious and seek the help that I needed. So you went down to Glide. What did you find there? What did you find when you went to Glide? <laughs> um, unbelievably, I found a lot of support, a lot of help, and things that I never knew. Hi, 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 don't bake the door down, I'm coming. Jennifer may be in recovery, but her brothers and sisters are not. Caught in a web of drugs and jail, their eight children stay here with Diane. Hang up your coat and come and eat. With this many children under the one roof, food is always the major topic of conversation. No more. Each week, Diane receives $80 plus food stamps. The government calls this generous, but it is simply not enough to feed her family. So what do you do? I go on one meal a day. I eat at night. And the kids eat lunch at school. And snack gets smaller and smaller, are non-existent. And if we really get short, we go to Glide. The government's solution to this problem is to demand that Diane be retrained and to find work. What it means for that woman is not only do you have two years, get a job, it means that we are going to pay for you to get trained, we are going to pay for your child care, we're going to cover each and every one of those children with competent either preschool care or other sorts of after school care or infant toddler care. This is the no excuses policy. No excuse that you can't get child care to get a job. No excuse that you can't get medical coverage for yourself or your children to get a job. No excuses that you're not going to have training to get a job. For Diane, the clock of welfare reform is ticking. I don't even think about it day to day because if I worry, then I'm not going to be able to function and I'm not going to do the kids any good or me any good. The problem with the welfare reform is that it's a welfare disaster. Even if there is work out there for a sizable number of people, it will still be at the level of not being much more than what they are already getting on welfare. If he is right and families fall between the cracks, there will be just one place left to go. Glide will simply have to find more places at the table and stretch the fried chicken just that much further.
If the congregation looks burdened, it doesn't show it. Each Sunday brings with it new excitements, new rewards, and today is no exception. I want to christen you in the name, first of all, of your family, mom and your dad. This is a Glide baby. It may not know it now, but it has become part of the strangest church in America. Finally, I want to christen you in the name of the Spirit and of the love of the Spirit that is manifest to all of us. Mwah.